Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,670. Today I'm with a professional race team of women who compete in sports car racing around the world. Buckle up. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I am in Birmingham, Michigan today with a very special guest by the name of Beth Peretta. Beth, welcome to Cars Yeah. Are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? I am. I'll bet you've heard that a few times. Now, before I give you a proper introduction, what's one little thing you might share with my listeners that maybe most people don't know about you? I used to ski for a living. You you figured out how to ski for a living. Now, this was water skiing or snow skiing? Snow skiing. Snow, okay, so how did you figure that one out? I know, right? Um, and I think that kind of started me on the path of that idea of do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. Um, from high school all the way through college and several years after, I worked in the alpine skiing business. And wow. so I used to get paid to test product and sh- and dem- demo product and lived in northern Vermont and was very lucky, lucky to uh, not have to pay for lift tickets for many, many years. You were fortunate. I skied a lot when I was a kid and I remember going up and always thought, man, maybe, you know, next winter I should be a ski bum. And then my parents yep. would go, no, you're not going to be a ski bum. <laughs> but exactly. uh, it always looked a little bit fun. You know, these guys you'd meet up there that were just kind of playboys and having a good old time. And I've always, yep. w- always wondered, well, where are they now? Did they exactly. ever, did they ever so- really grow up? Exactly. Some of them have not. I can. I certainly have uh, examples of that. Some of them haven't. Some of them have parlayed it into careers. And then some of them, like me, had that realization, I want to be able to pay full retail for a, a lift ticket and all my ski equipment. So I need to do something that's going to pay me some more money. Yeah, those lift tickets even back then were expensive, but uh, exactly. they've gotten really pricey now. Well, let me give Beth a proper introduction and we're going to dive into her life here. Beth Peretta launched Grace Autosport, a professional race team of women to compete in sports car racing around the world. She created Grace as an initiative to promote STEM education for girls using the race team as the ultimate example of applied science. Her automotive field career include times with great marks like Aston Martin, Fiat Chrysler Automobiles, Honda, Audi, Bentley, Lamborghini, and Volkswagen. She worked to create and execute marketing campaigns for the SRT product portfolio, launching several new vehicles, including the Gen V Viper, and managed the operations of FCA racing programs and series, including NASCAR, IMSA, SRO, World Challenge, AMA, Supercross, Trans Am, Rallycross, and the 24 Hour of Le Mans. This is one fast lady. Today, (laughs) Beth also manages U.S. sales operations for French racing fuel manufacturer ETS Racing Fuels, and she serves on the board of directors at the Motorsports Hall of Fame in America. We'll be back in just a minute to talk with Beth, but first, a word from our valued sponsors that make this show possible. Give them a little listen, give them a little love, better yet, give them a little business, and we will be right back. Keep your seatbelts on. The best way to protect your vehicles is with a Covercraft Custom Fit Car Cover. I know because I've been using their covers on my vehicles since 1975. Plus, they offer a multitude of options depending on your situation. Indoor covers include Form Fit, Dust Stop, the Oh So Soft Fleece Satin, and their very unique View Shield, a cover that protects while allowing you to see your favorite vehicle while the cover's on your car. Amazing. Need a cover that will protect your ride outside? Their incredible options allow you to choose from Weather Shield, Sombrella, Weather Shield HD, Block It, Reflect, Carhartt, Evolution, Nova, and Weather Shield HP. So many options. Whether you're looking for rain protection, UV shielding from the sun's damaging rays, breathability, dust protection, snow protection, even ding protection, and protection from those paint-destroying bird droppings. They've got you covered. Their soft-touch covers are safe for your paint, and the custom fit keeps them from blowing off. If you live in a windy area, get the Covercraft Gust Guards. 
They're a must-have if your car sits outside in windy conditions. Worried about theft? They have cable locks, too, with built-in grommets that keep your cover safely on your vehicle. Their website makes ordering fast and easy, and their talented customer service department will walk you through any ordering questions. They can customize a cover for almost any vehicle on the planet. And I've got a deal for you. If you use the code yeah 120 at covercraft.com you'll get 10 percent off your covercraft order that's right so go to covercraft.com use the code yeah y-e-a-h 120 at checkout and get 10 percent off on me mark here at cars yeah covercraft they've got you covered let's step away from the conversation and talk about our charity of choice here at cars yeah america's Automotive Trust. America's Automotive Trust is a group of like minded nonprofits that are working together to preserve and promote car culture across the country. Together, they provide scholarships and grants to aspiring technicians and restoration artists. They provide youth education programs and bring communities together through auto related events, car shows, and drives. Among these nonprofits is TechForce Foundation, a great organization dedicated to solving the technician shortage that threatens the transportation industry today. By providing career development resources and increasing awareness and enthusiasm for the tech profession, TechForce is bringing bright young students into the auto, diesel, aviation, marine, motorcycle, motorsports, and restoration worlds. To date, they've awarded more than $10 million in scholarships and grants to tech students. And in times like these, I don't have to tell you how essential those techs are, keeping our delivery and emergency vehicles running and keeping America rolling. To learn more about Tech Force or to make a donation to this cause, visit www.techforce.org. You'll be glad you did. All right, Beth, we're back. And as we continue on this journey that I'm going to call your life around the automotive sector, I want you to share a mantra or maybe a success quote. This is something that might have great meaning for you. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires smoking here on Cars, yeah? So, Beth, I know you love to drive. Grab the wheel. So uh, I thought about this, and it's funny. I I saw something on a T-shirt, which is maybe the the best origin for uh, life quotes, and it was, (laughs) don't believe everything you think. What stuck with me is I think there's so many times that we overthink things and we can kind of, especially in an entrepreneurial venture or in business, we can overanalyze and we can maybe try to listen to too many consultants. And we've probably, I'm sure there's many of your listeners that work in different industries and have gone through that dance with, uh, you know, having external consultants come in. People can tell you how to do things better. And I'm not saying to block everybody out, but I think as we get better at what we do, the key is to sort of uh, be able to determine quickly what information you can use and what is unnecessary. And especially in a time like now where we've a lot of us have been working from home, many people who've maybe never worked from home before, you know, you have those video calls all day and, you know, we kind of lose some of that human interaction and that nuance. And it's very easy to overthink, like, what did that person mean by that? Or what is their attitude? And I think it can wind up being um, distracting and negative noise. So I, uh, I say that and, and the over-examined life isn't worth living. And people always say the under-examined life, but I kind of flip that around to say, sometimes by um, living too much in our own head, we fail to act. So the idea of sometimes just trust your gut and you know, obviously, be colla- I've, I've always been collaborative, so I'm, I, I still want to solicit people's opinions and ideas. But the more that you do that, you still have to go back to kind of trust yourself and trust your instincts and, and get out of your own head sometimes. <laughs> That's great advice. I know we do get tied up in our own head in this new world that we're living in right now with uh, lack of communication, but maybe in some ways more communication. But then, yeah, you're trying to read somebody's, I mean, it's hard enough to figure out what somebody really means in an email or a text. Right. When you add a Zoom window and then a lot of Zoom windows and you're like, what are they thinking? What are they doing? And then what's that in the background? And why is their shirt, why are they wearing that shirt? Right. Is that a puppy? Right. Are they petting a dog? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. I, I, just, I just had a meeting uh, in person a few days ago with somebody and over a lunch and that I hadn't, who I hadn't met before. And afterward, it was very apparent. I was like, oh my goodness, I don't know that I could have done that introductory meeting over a Zoom call as well. It was really nice to just look somebody in the eyes and, and feel a sense of of trust or you know, or or the opposite you know do you want to move forward with working with somebody and it it's there's that subtle nuance of human interaction that i'm sure everybody's kind of craving 
right now. Oh yeah. Yeah. We need to get back to that. And it even transpires to when you, you have to be out and wearing masks and you can't even see people's expressions right. and what they're doing. My, my wife works at a private school and she mm -hmm. said it's so difficult with the kids because you can't see the expressions on their face. They can't see yours. Yep. You're wondering, what are they thinking? They're wondering, what are they thinking? They don't know. I, it's all in the eyes. If you can even yeah. see the eyes sometimes. Absolutely. I really feel for kids right now, especially it's almost like the lost year for all of us, but it's, it it's has been. more critical when you're younger. To absolutely. Have a lost year. Well, yeah. let's talk about Grace Autosport first. And I also want to talk about ETS Racing Fuels. You combined mm -hmm. a variety of things into your career here. But mm -hmm. I really reached out to you at the beginning was regarding Grace Autosport and this mm -hmm. all-female racing team, which yeah. I find so fascinating. And I'm very interested in women in the automotive sector. I've interviewed almost 300 here on Cars, yeah. I've, right. I've given a little teases that I'm about to launch a new podcast that's focused on the female sector. That's all I'm going to say right now, but that's Good. that's coming up very soon. So tell me all about Grace Autosport. Why, when, what, <laughs> what are you doing? Well, it's funny because to talk about it, it, because we haven't raced, people might have thought that it was uh, that it that it doesn't exist or that it that we that it kind of went to sleep. But I can say that uh, I launched it at the beginning of 2015. Kind of started thinking it through at the end of 2014 with a good friend of mine, and we uh, we looked to launch it in 15 in order to race in 16. And um, the idea at the time, so I was working for Fiat Chrysler and running the SRT brand and motorsports for one of, one of the big three, or certainly one of the global major auto manufacturers. And to run a performance division and motorsport for a major auto manufacturer, I learned once I was in that role that I was the first woman to ever be in that kind of uh, in that kind of role for a major car company. And like most women, and I'm sure most of the women that you've interviewed, honestly, I didn't know that until somebody else pointed that out to me. Somebody else told me, because of course, most of us are just busy doing our jobs. We don't kind of, you know, Right. Uh, we're constantly reminding people that we're women. It should be obvious. Um, but, <laughs> the, uh, but the thing uh, that was sort of with with the motorsport responsibility that I had on the professional side and the corporate side and running these different motorsport programs and really seeing how racing has evolved over the year as a business, you know, there there's challenges, as we all know, in getting getting what regardless of what discipline of racing you watch, whether you watch NASCAR, Formula One, sports car racing with IMSA, IndyCar, everybody can use to use more viewers. And we can say that for any sort of, you know, um, entertainment, because ultimately that's, you know, although racing is sport, it ultimately is structured, it's entertainment. And we, somebody had brought the idea of what if we put a, an all women's team together, would it, you know, would that attract more viewers? And yes, it could. But the reality was here, I was working for a, a major car company and I knew that you can do something like that and it's a splash and it gains attention, but really the value in any sort of program is if you do something with it. And here I was working for a car company that, that saw day to day that there was a, uh, a shortage of, of of engineers, regardless of gender, that the rate of attrition of, of engineers retiring, they're retiring at a faster rate than they're being hired. So if you looked at the future, the short-term future, it was going to be a bit of a crisis. And again, and yes, I'm looking at the automotive industry at the time, but you can extrapolate that across you know many different industries and a lot of people that were going into tech careers were very much going into like IT like we were talking about you know whether it's you know cybersecurity or building an app but the actual like mechanical engineering electrical engineers that sort of thing had kind of diminished and so there was a real need and and that's a need that we share nationally globally and so the idea was okay well if we can get more women to go into these fields and stay in these fields it's one thing to study these subjects it's another thing to then pursue a career and stay in it then that really benefits benefits all of us and so i started doing a ton of research understanding you know what makes you know, what are things that can support ki uh, kids in education, looking at the disparity between the sort of the inequity that happens with the, the just sort of the education across different regions within our country, et cetera, and really kind of immersing myself in it. And then I said, okay, really what Grace is meant to be is an education platform that happens to have a race team. Kind of, you know, the the racing is applied science. Like of any sport of anything that can grab your attention, it's real, it's, it's um, tangible. And the reality is, having worked among racers and such, these are people that, that uh, can then go get a job working at, you know, you can be an aerodynamicist and go work for Boeing. You can work, be a, you know, a, a dynamics engineer working on chassis dynamics and then go work for Ford Motor Company. And those are real pathways. And it was really more the idea of opening it up to 
kind of just shining a light on something that already existed that maybe nobody was really shining a light on. Now, to talk about that in 2020 sounds like it's old hat and everybody knows that. But in 2015, it was met with a lot of blank stares. So we might have been a little early in the initiative. And I, and in fairness, you could tell because when you're an early mover on something, you can tell whether people get it or not based on the either glazed over look or the people that really kind of ran at it. And I look at different people that were very supportive early on, like the Roger Penske's of the world. And, and that's not by accident that somebody like that sees the value because that's somebody who's always thinking laterally. Anyway, so fast forward to 2016, we announced it in 15, we're going to run it in 16. And not to get ahead of myself based on kind of how we can talk about where the challenges kind of come up, but going through that process to get a car on the grid in the Indy 500 in 2016, there were some things that were happening behind the scenes that were not probably fully reported on at the time, which is fine. That was by choice. And it was, you know, just the idea of putting, putting a, d- a deal together. Uh, and actually, if we want, we can kind of go into that as I pause. Uh, <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, yeah. wherever you want to go. So even though we didn't make the grid in 2016 based on some circumstance, which I'll, I can tell you more about, since that time, I have worked continuously on the education side of it, which is really the nuts and bolts of why Grace matters. So working with museums, working with education partners, and, and also separately mentoring girls and young women, both individually and through other programs, that's really been the driver because it's, you know, you get to a certain point in your career and you look around, I, I remember being at, at both at Aston Martin and then later at Fiat Chrysler, whether in the production car side or the racing side, where I would be in a meeting and I'd be the only woman at the table. And there's that initial moment where you think, wow, that's kind of like, look at me, like, look, look how I, how far I've come. Because this wasn't like a family business for me. This wasn't something that like, I, you know, I followed any sort of path that was obvious for, for me. I mean, I'm from Connecticut. I, I didn't grow up in Detroit. So I very much got here based on interest, uh, hard work, and certainly good, good fortune by being in the right place at the right time and meeting people and, you know, pr- being prepared when those opportunities did arise. And so there's those moments of kind of like, hey, look, look where I, you know, I'm in, I'm in a boardroom or I'm at a, you know, representing a manufacturer in the highest racing series in the world or in the country and, and at the table making decisions. And then you realize, you know, a, a minute later, hang on. I shouldn't be the first woman or I shouldn't be the only woman or I shouldn't be like, we need to have more of us and more representation. And I say women as a category, but you know, any category, but the, uh, not to describe who else was at the table, but you can pretty much guess who was at the table. Right, sure. <laughs> and if we also want to attract more viewers and fans or more people buying our cars, we need to have more representation. It's like anything else. And because now it's, everybody's talking that way. But again, these are, you know, over the past 10 years, this has been a slow evolution. And it takes time to move that exactly. big, that big change that has exactly. to happen. I, I, understand. Carrier. Yeah. I understand. Now you also work uh, at ETS Racing Fuels yes. as if you're not busy enough. <laughs> Right. Yes. I like to have multiple things going on so that my brain isn't bored. But yeah, ETS Racing Fuels was an interesting sort of connection. I, I They reached out to me about two years ago, and it's a company that has existed since the late 80s. ETS originally was the racing fuel division of ESSO, ExxonMobil. It was ESSO mm-hmm. Technology and Services and made fuel for Formula One and, uh, and Le Mans and all these different applications. And they spun off and became independent now owned by a large German petrochem. So the nice thing is you have, you know, that infrastructure behind you, but it's very high end boutique uh, race fuel, racing and performance fuels. So vintage racing, again, Formula One, um, Supercross, Motocross, but they have no brand awareness in North America. So if you haven't heard of them, that you're not alone. So yeah, best working on that. <laughs> right. Fully working on it. But it's kind of nice because, you know, I love building brands. I love building, I should say, I mean, especially it's a luxury to build a brand when the product is great. Yes. And, you know, having worked for Aston Martin or having worked for SRT, uh, you know, when you've got a good product, it's exciting to talk about something that's, that's, that can kind of back up. That's really good. Yeah. yeah. Well, you talked earlier and I want to, migrated into this next question about challenge. I always ask my guests about challenge or failures. You talked about that time, I think it was 2016, women getting into indie. Can you dive into that a little bit? Is that a good one, a good segue into this question? 
Yeah, that one's a gem. I bet. <laughs> so yeah, that's that's a story I like to usually save for a cocktail. So, but we're <laughs> buckled up, so we might as well. Yeah. So the the situation was this. So I wind up getting a, a an engine contract. I have sp- I have sponsors. I've got a driver. I've got all the pieces. And and people might not know this, but a regular Indy car race during this season is about 22 cars, 21, 22 cars on the grid. The Indy 500 is always 33 cars. So the way that you build up that that those extra cars in the field are people that do that, that race as a one-off, as we call it. And the way that you do that, the feasibility of that, how that even works, is oftentimes you might have a full-time racing or full-time Indy car team that might run two cars through the whole season or three cars through the whole season. And for the Indy 500, they add a a third or fourth car. Those cars and the people that run those cars are basically for rent, for lack of a better explanation. So if you've got a driver and you've got a sponsor and you've got, you know, you've got some people, you can, you can get on the grid. There are also some teams that only run the Indy 500 and it's the same format. So people might always, uh, if you know, your listeners may not, may wonder how, how does that happen? How do these people sort of fall out of the sky and just do one race? There's sort of a system in place and it's an, it's been in place for years. In fact, many years, you know, you, you, you'd have up to goodness, you can have 40 cars um, trying to make the grid and, and only the top 33 make it. And that's why qualifying weekend and bump day is, is so um, exciting because right. it's about who can make the grid. So that's how it works. And so we had all the pieces in place and we had a partner team that we were meant to work with. And going into Long Beach, which is is about six weeks before the 500, six to seven weeks before the 500, the Long Beach race in April, we were going to have the press conference on the Friday. Um, you can look back and see that it was on the schedule. And the, the engine manufacturer was part of it. The partner team was part of it. The driver, all of us, it was going to be the, the big announcement of how, you know, how we were going to, to be on the grid in, you know, in, in a few weeks in Indianapolis. Mm-hmm. And two days before the press conference, the team that we were working with tried to change the terms of the deal. Oh. And you always hear these sort of stories of different things and things falling apart and, and whatnot. And, and you know that you understand that some of that can happen. But this was a really unfortunate scenario because this team owner wanted to change the terms of the deal, move us off of the Indy 500, have us do a couple of races during the year. And basically, I wind up catching wind putting somebody else in the car, like basically taking a different deal. Okay, fine. Right. For a little bit more money. Didn't give me the option to see if I could counter the the, the higher uh, amount of money, yeah. which I could have because I had a lot of money in my back pocket at the time, you know, very much on purpose because for such events, you kind of always want to make sure that you've got a little bit of, of extra. Mm-hmm. And instead of even having that discussion, it was, hey, you know, we're going to move you off of the 500 and we'll have you run these other races. And he still was going to take take my money and then take this other deal. And he, in his mind, he's looking that he's going to double his money. Okay. All right. I don't think so. Right, right. Like I might've been born on a Tuesday, yeah, but... but not yet. So I said, no, you know, like, no, we're not, we're not unwinding the deal. So I had to go and cancel the press conference. But what that then did is it then set me off on a wild goose chase because I then had to go find another partner to run with in another chassis. And in 2016, it happened to be a unique year. It was the 100th running. And if you look back and you can kind of see this, it was sort of this perfect storm of a lot of things. There were many teams that would normally run a, run an extra car that had actually opted not to. In fact, I can now say in 2015, I had actually been in talks with Penske. Penske was going to run us. And then at the end of 15, his plans changed. And so he had called me and said, I'm not going to run a fifth car. I can't run you in the fifth car. We're only going to run four. Mm. And it's in fact, uh, in early 16, it was funny because Oriel Servia subbed for Will Power at St. Pete and uh, Oriel sat down with Roger that weekend and it was more circumstance. Will Power was sick and it just was coincidence that Oriel was available and they had a, they put him in the car for St. Pete. And this is, you know, beginning of 16. And Roger said to Oriel, you know, how am I going to pay you? And Oriel said, oh, for the weekend at St. Pete. And Oriel's like, no, no. He's like, you don't have to pay me. Um, just put me in, you know, can you run me at Indy? I, don't pay me, just run me at Indy. And Roger said to him, I can't, he's like, I, I can't run you at Indy. I'm only running four cars. Besides, if I'm running a fifth, I'm going to run Beth. I was going to run Beth Peretta. And it's funny because it was just lovely to hear that. I actually heard that story from Oriole like later. I was like, that's kind of nice to know yeah. that. You know, and, and But it also shows you some people keep their word. Integrity. Yep. Um, integrity, exactly. And uh, so anyway, with that said, it started me on this wild goose chase of, all right, I've got to find another car to put this engine in and put all this deal together. And uh, I, I started running at everything. And God bless, Chevy was the, the um, I had a deal with Chevy and a deal with Honda. Chevy was super supportive. They both were, but the Chevy 
thing was a little bit more ro robust and a little bit more long term. And it got to the point where like they even said, hey, if you can get a, a Honda chassis to run and like we get it, like just get on the grid. So it was just knocking on every door and saying like, do you have a car? Do you have a car? And there weren't any. And you can see because there were other teams that kind of got caught out with this as, you know, as the weeks kind of and, and the time took right. off for what it was worth too. Right after that Long Beach weekend, I even called Delara to see if we could buy a car. And believe it or not, they didn't have one ready. They said, we can build one, but it's going to take us seven weeks. And at that wow. point, we needed it in like five because, yeah. you know, my was starting. So anyway, the moral of the story is we wind up, there was one last available chassis that I, I had uh, I had the opportunity to, to put us into, but it had been used a bunch. It was going to have to be completely rebuilt. There was a, a questionable whether or not we could get all the parts in time. So it was again, going to be very much under the wire. And I had to pull. And so I ultimately made the decision to pull the plug. And it was a very difficult decision. Obviously, it's a very public thing. And I definitely had to take it on the chin. And it's funny because like in 2012, I had gone through this with FCA and NASCAR. And mm. there, I had come in and I'm running this NASCAR program that we wind up pulling the plug on. I don't pull the plug. It happens to be this whole corporate thing. There's a political thing going on that also has never been fully told. That's again. That's for another cocktail. That's for, that's for cars. Yeah. After dark. There you, oh, there you go. <laughs> but uh, again, like a very public thing where I think, you know, I definitely took took a lot of heat where people are saying like, oh, you know, you came in and you, you took this program down. And the funny thing is, you know, behind the scenes, everyone knew, including Penske, like, you know, we were very much championing keeping the program alive. And again, there was just circumstance. And, and yeah. you know, and my the takeaway is, although you make you have to make these difficult decisions when you're in the middle of them, I think if you can look back and feel like you made the best decision with the info, with the information that was available to you at the time. Mm -hmm. And but if in that moment you made the best, because you, know, you can always say, well, I wish I knew that then. Well, no, no, that's not how you can really look back at things. Right. You have to say at that moment, this is what I had in front of me. Did I make the best decision? And if you did, then you shouldn't be able to, then you shouldn't look back with regret. Right. Yeah. You know? There and you so, go. so that's kind of where I got to. And the moral of the story is that, team ran the other person who, who, by the way, the driver that they put out into that car where we kind of had the whole, yeah. you know, musical chair situation is a, is a dear, a dear friend. We compared notes later. He had no idea what was going on, nor sure. did, you know, yeah. so, and he's, he's lovely, but that team didn't get paid all the amount of money that they thought they were going to get paid. Oops. And that team doesn't exist anymore. There you go. Yeah, right. the moral of so, the story. The moral, wow. Or the moral of the story is sometimes the sh sometimes the short, quick, what you might think might be the the better, easier path might might not be it. You yeah, know, probably but, isn't. Yeah, it's <laughs> not. The yeah, I'd, say, I'd say the best is if you can. You know, sometimes the decision that you have to make and the conclusion isn't what you wanted, isn't ideal. But if you can look back and say, "I made the best decision with the information I had," then no regrets. There you go. No regrets. We're going to take a short break and thank our sponsors. When we come back, we're going to dive into your personal passion for cars. So keep your seatbelt on. We are moving quick here with Beth Beretta. Hang on to your seat. American Collectors Insurance. That's who now protects my Porsche Turbo. Yeah, the one I call my orange crush. When it came time to renew my policy, my carrier jacked my rates up, even though I'd been with him for years. I'd never made a claim. No tickets, nothing. What's with that? Adios. So I started shopping around and kept hearing about American Collectors Insurance from fellow automotive enthusiasts, friends, and folks in the car industry. I did some investigating and learned that American Collectors Insurance have been protecting collector vehicles since 1976. I'm not a price shopper when it comes to insurance. I want to be able to sleep at night. I also want agreed value protection for my special ride. With an agreed valued policy from American Collectors Insurance, I'll be paid what my vehicle's full agreed value is. A number I set with the insurer at the start of the policy so I know there will be no surprises about what my car's value is, should something terrible happen. I shopped around and decided to protect my car with American Collectors Insurance. Give them a call for a quote today at 866-ACI, yeah, that's 866 866- 224-9324 and protect the ones you love. Make sure you tell them Mark sent you. You'll be glad you did. American Collectors Insurance. Classic car insurance designed by collectors for collectors. So, what do you do after running a race team for 27 years with over 100 podiums, multiple Daytona wins, and a win at Le Mans? Well, if you're racer and the racers group team owner Kevin Buckler 
you start Adobe Road Winery. It's located in Petaluma, California, and he and his team have created a winning combination with the Racing Series, four ultra-premium red wine blends that are in a class of their own. Like racing, these wines comprise of art, precision, engineering, science, wrapped in a whole lot of fun. You can choose from four blends titled Redline, Apex, Shift, and the 24. Today, I'm going to talk about Shift. This wine was awarded 93 points by Robert Parker's Wine Advocate. It's balanced and spicy with dark blueberries and a cigar aroma. The unique bottle shape features a vintage-inspired metal gated shift back with carbon fiber, and the cork is topped with a five-speed shift knob. That's right. There's going to be some battles at the dinner table on who gets to keep the cork after this bottle has been enjoyed. The Racing Series is a delicious gift for the automotive enthusiast in your life, and I've got a deal for you. If you use the code CARSYEAH, all one word in caps, at checkout, you get $10 off any purchase of the wines from the Racing Series. Your wine ships promptly and arrives quickly right at your door. Use the code CARSYEAH at checkout and get $10 off your purchase from the Racing Series today. There's always a seat at the table for excellence with the Racing Series. Go to adoberoadwines.com and use the code CARSYEAH today. Cheers! All right, we're back, and I would love for you to share a story that instigated your personal passion for the automotive world, the racing world. What was that pivotal moment in your life, Beth, when you knew you were going to be a bit of a car gal? It started when I was three years old. Three. I know it, <laughs> yes, I know it specifically. So I grew up in Connecticut. My dad, when I was really little, had a 1930 Model A Ford that he uh, restored and drove. And my brother at the time wanted to have a project car. And he kind of convinced my dad, like, why he wanted to have a truck. And the idea was, let's get a truck, let's restore it. And then it'll be his when he turned 16. Because my brother was probably about 13, 14. I think it was like 14 at the time. So yeah, it's going to be this project. They wind up deciding, my dad and my brother decided to get a 1952 Ford pickup. They bought one and then they bought another one for parts and they started working on it in the garage. And it was the kind of thing like nights and weekends, you know, because my my dad had a full-time job, my brother's in high school and I was like three years old, four years old. And so the garage became this hive of activity, you know, this, this restoration and parts needing to be cleaned. And what was really cool is I'd wander in there and they very easily could have shooed me away. But instead, because it was 11 years difference between my brother and I, wow. um, instead of shooing me away, they'd give me a part to clean. And it was really kind of a cool thing. And it became like sort of this, like, like I say, this hive of activity where neighbors would come by and just sort of like my dad's friend would just, you know, sit and they'd chat while, while we're all working on this, this truck very social and whatnot. Well, my brother, uh, my brother had leukemia and he died before the truck was finished. Oh, sorry. Uh, got, thank you. It got, it got pretty far along, but he died before it was finished. And he died when he was 17. So he did oh get his gosh. driver's license and he did drive like a modern car. Yeah, wow. And, you know, he drove my dad's, my dad's like daily driver pickup truck at the time. And I remember when he got it, the day he got his driver's license, bless him. He came home. My brother came home with his driver's license. And the first thing he did was take me for a ride. Oh, nice. Which is like, if you think about that, a 16 year old kid, and the first thing he does is take his five year old sister for a ride yeah. is really, you know, says a lot also about how sweet our relationship was. And because yeah. obviously it was a big gap in age. And nice. so, it's just sort of stuck with me. So my, my brother passed away. And then I uh, started uh, like as a five-year-old, as a six-year-old, I started reading uh, car magazines. And I now know that that was very much a way for me to have a dialogue with my dad and sort of like take up that missing piece. Right. And I just learned that actually happens a lot when you have sort of a, you know, when you lose a sibling that the, the remaining sibling can sometimes do that. It's just sort of like a natural. Fill in that yeah. void. Was there a first special car in your life came into your life? Well, it's funny that you say that because, you know, fast forward to, I went away to college. My dad winds up, uh, we still had the truck. My dad restored it. And then, uh, and he drove it. He would have it as like this extra truck that, you know, he'd take to Home Depot and get mulch and stuff. And fast forward to 2010, I'm working for Aston Martin. I'm um, in the driveway at my parents' house um, where I just actually had, a, there was an Aston Martin brand new DBS Volante delivered in the parking, in the driveway because I had to take it to right. an event. I had a Lotus Elise that I'm my personal fun car. I'm washing my company car for Aston. I had a Land Rover is in the driveway. And my dad is watching this, the 1952 Ford pickup that, that they had, he had worked, you know, had gotten with my brother. Yeah. 
And my dad said to me, here it is, it's 2010. So this is 10 years ago. And my dad said, we're both, so he's washing the truck. I'm washing my Lotus. And we're kind of, you know, out with the suds, sudsy bucket. (laughs) And my dad said, uh, I think I'm going to sell the truck. And I said, what? And he's like, well, what are you and mom going to do with it? Like, I think, you know, it's time to sell it. Like, what are you and mom going to do with it? And I looked at him and I said, well, if you're going to sell it, I'll buy it. And he said, well, you'd want it. And I said, dad, that truck's not leaving this family. Like that. That's Michael's truck. Yeah. And, I, and I looked at everything like the, the I said, pointed, I pointed to the Aston Martin. I pointed to the Lotus. I pointed to my, my company car. And I said, dad, look, I said, what do you think all of this is? My career, yeah. my life is because of that truck. I said, I can trace my entire life to a VIN number and it's on that truck. Wow. That's and my cool. dad handed me the keys and he said, <laughs> it's yours. Yours. Because oh, well. I'll be honest, we'd never talked about it. It was sort of like this unspoken yeah. thing. And he didn't realize, although it meant so much to him, and I think he was so caught up in his, in his own thoughts and attachment to the truck, right. it never occurred to him that it meant so much to me to the point where I so went like headlong into it. And it's become my yeah. life. Yeah. And I'm very proud to say that right now that truck is in my garage here in your garage. What a wonderful story. That's, that's awesome. Wow. Thanks. Very cool. Well, I'm going to get in your head with a very introspective question. If you woke up tomorrow, Beth, and you were manifest as a vehicle, not what you want to be, but how you perceive your personality into a vehicle, what would Beth be and why? I think I'd be a Lancia Stratos. Ooh, interesting. Okay. Well, with a last name like Pareta. Exactly. Yes. (laughs) one it is italian it's um i i think because it's small it's nimble good power to weight ratio yeah i mean the curved windshield kind of always gets me yeah that's kind of nice i think think, um it's one of those you know it's rare it's kind of uh you know it's a it's Read into its own. I love Alantia Stratos. I do too. Awesome, awesome choice. All right, we're in the what I call the last lap. You've been there. You've been at a track many times. The white flag's out. Checker flag's waving way down in the distance. I'm going to rattle off some very quick questions for some very quick answers from you. Some quick blips of that Lancia Stratos throttle. So here we go. What's one of your personal habits that you believe has contributed to your many successes in life? I'm an avid reader. Oh, okay. Well, we're going to get to a reading question in a minute. Now, if I could arrange for you to have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? It would have been different 10 years ago. I would have had a longer list and I've been blessed to uh, meet a lot of people in automotive and racing that I probably, I have been fans of, but I can now call them friends and and honestly family. So the answer is different than it would have been. I, w- I will say Dan Weldon. Oh. And- for that is I actually never met him. Hmm. But uh, soon after he passed, I wound up getting to be very close to a lot of people, uh, family and friends. And his sister, Holly, Uh, is one of my dearest friends. And I would love the opportunity to tell him what a lovely young woman. (laughs) Dan, what a loss. Uh, Yeah. uh, Everyone I've ever talked to that's ever been around him or knew him in any way speaks so highly of him. So yeah, yeah, terrible loss. But so nice you became a friend of of his sister. That's very cool. Now, when it comes to automotive advice, what's the best advice someone else has ever offered to you check your mirrors check your, yeah all the time yeah <laughs> that's what they're there for that's well, what they're there for now when it comes to resources there's so many these days is there kind of a go-to for you daily a place you find yourself uh reading stuff racer.com i'm, I'm always on racer automotive news uh but um you can always check us out ets racing fuels of course is the website for my company you're going to see some stuff hopefully soon from grace uh, autosport both track side and in addition to the education stuff we're doing, I've, I've been remiss in updating this stuff, even though I've been slowly working on it in the background. Um, but hopefully you'll, you know, watch this space. Watch this space. I'll make sure I put all these great links on Grace's, on Grace's. Well, Grace will be there on Beth's show notes page on the Cars yeah website. I love that name, by the way, Grace. Thank uh, you. Yeah, great, great choice. Thank now, you. you mentioned loving to read. Is there a book huh? you'd like to share with our listeners? I would say The Alchemist ah. by Paulo Coelho. I'm sure, I don't know if other people have said that, but uh, yeah, to realize one's destiny is a person's only obligation. I will say as much as I'm an avid reader, I mostly read nonfiction and I read all the time and I, I'm always reading the news. I'm always reading, uh, you know, trade and, you know, industry stuff. But The Alchemist is the only book that I have can genuinely see that I've read multiple times. Ah, yeah, great book, classic book. 
for sure. And all, an easy read too. If you haven't read it, read it. It's like 160 pages, but it's very much just about following your heart to find your destiny. Yeah. Don't yeah. let the title scare you away. No, <laughs> for, <not> sure. <laughs> no. for sure. All right, Beth, we're up to the checkered flag. You've been here many times as well. Today, I'm going to buy you a very cool collector car. Now, I usually tell my guests there's a couple rules to this game. And one is that it's the only collector car you have. I'm going to remove that truck from the list here okay. today because otherwise that we know where you're going to go and I'd like to be surprised. So let's park the truck around the side of the garage there, but you mm -hmm. can keep that. I know I'm going to have a few guests and go, hey, how come Beth got special got treatment? Car. Right. Well, because right. Beth is cool. That's why. Thank you. It's a car I want you to enjoy. I want it to tick a lot of boxes, so I don't want it to sit around and collect dust. But you can't sell it to fund a racing yeah. team or anything. So if you pick a very expensive Ferrari, <laughs> You well, stuck with yeah. it. Yeah, I knew what you're going to do. You're going to be <laughs> racing an Indy next year, and you're going to have it all funded by picking right. a GTO. All right. right, Beth, what is it I'm going to be buying you today? Honestly, I love a proper GT car. Um, something maybe with a V12, pure lines. I have always loved a 550 Marinello. Oh. Um, I like it because it's got clean lines. It's a proper gentleman's uh, touring car. You can you know get in it and drive to Chicago and be comfortable, but it's still a dynamic drive. And honestly, if you've never done it, the sound and the feel of driving something with a gated shifter. Yeah. And so I would choose a 550 Marinello, and I'm also very lucky to have one of those in my garage too. Oh, nice, cool. Which that was a that was a, a lovely, uh, very lucky to kind of have that uh, yeah. added to the table a couple of years ago, and I will not get rid of that. Car. There you go. I love it. Sounds good. I always love it when my guests already have a dream car. Uh, that way, it doesn't cost me any money, but they're already living the dream. So I think that's pretty fantastic. Which sounds like maybe it's more about dreaming the car, dreaming about the car that you already have, and maybe that makes maybe it lends it more contentment, right? Maybe so. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, I love it. Beth, this has been great. You are such a fantastic person. I've really enjoyed getting to know you better. You definitely got to come back. I love the uh, Cars yeah After Dark. You just planted a seed <laughs> in my brain here. Hmm, oh, yeah, we can tell you all the stories that we can't tell you. That you can't tell well, you during the normal yeah. Cars yeah show. That may pop up one day, so uh, I'll attribute that to you. Before I let you go, though, could you offer us one little parting piece of wisdom or guidance before you rip off into the sunset in that 550 Marinello? I will say this. In the endurance race of life... Never give up because even, I mean, I, I, I had some challenges in 2016 that I kind of touched on. There was a lot more to it. Again, we'll talk about that another time. But I would say in the endurance race of life, never give up. Even if you have to go behind the wall for a few laps, get back out there yeah. because you can still finish in the points. There you go. Wonderful advice. And how can people keep up with you and follow along with you? Uh, honestly, you can find the most at Twitter. I'm at Beth Peretta on Twitter, uh, graceautosport.com, um, but also check out ETS Racing Fuels, uh, not just for racing, racing and performance. So vintage cars, everything, but I mean, the best quality fuels that uh, you can put into your car, motorcycle, whatever, and get a little bit more uh, performance. You can just pour in the power. I'd love to uh, put some of that in my 87 Porsche Turbo. I affectionately call my orange crush. Nice. It would run very nice on that. Very cool. Yeah. Beth, Hi. thank you for being so generous and fun today and for spending some time with me. Uh, until you and I talk again, my friend, I'll see you either down the road or at Car Yeah After Dark. Absolutely. I look forward to it. All right. This has been great. Thanks so much. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for enthusiasts and collectors. It's your monthly must-read, whether you dream of owning a collector car, maybe you have two, or maybe you've got 200. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years, and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Here's a couple deals I have for you just for listening here on Cars Yeah!, if you use the checkout code Cars Yeah, you'll receive a 50% discount on your digital subscription at Sports Car Market. That's an exclusive offer from Cars Yeah. And guess what? Here's another deal. If you'd like to get the actual magazine, use the code BSH for buy, sell, hold. That's code BSH. And you'll get $10 off your annual print subscription. That's right. $10 off. Both of these are exclusive offers here at Cars Yeah for Sports Car Market Magazine. Just go to sportscarmarket.com and get your deals today. 
If you're listening to Cars Yeah, you've probably spent some time working on your favorite ride. But how confident are you working on your finances? You may be able to rebuild a fuel injection system, but can you decipher the details of a mutual fund? If you're like me, investments, insurance, annuities, budgeting, and other financial concepts may seem a bit daunting, but what if I told you there's a book that describes these subjects and more in an easy-to-read and a very humorous way? My friend Chris Kimball, CFP, a longtime sponsor and past guest here on Cars Yeah, has written that book, and it's titled The Saga of Ike and Penny, a couple's humorous journey through the confusing world of finance. It's a fun look at things you need to know, everything from investing to effective ways to get rid of credit card debt, and it's probably the only book on finance with a VMAX on the front cover and a classic Mini Cooper on the back. The book's available at Amazon for just $10, and this book will dramatically improve the direction of your financial future. I gave copies to each of my children. All securities are through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Christopher Kimball Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Get your copy, The Saga of Ike and Penny, today. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah! Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!